Hey everyone, welcome back to the Personality Hacker Podcast. My name is Joel Mark Witt. And I'm Antonia Dodge. Today we are continuing our series where we do a deep dive into all 16 of the Myers-Briggs personality types. And today we're talking about the ESFP personality types in the Myers-Briggs system or the sensation authenticity type in the personality hacker system. And this is the first of the sensor types that we're tackling. So we just finished the eight intuitive styles, and now we're doing a deep dive into our first sensor style. And I think the reason why we want to start with ESFPs is you have your brother's an ESFP. Yes. My nephew is an ESFP, and we've had some really good friends who have been of this type, and they're really lovely people. Now, obviously, that's a gross oversimplification. You can have horrible human beings of any type. But what we've noticed is that, especially in, say, Myers-Briggs communities, I think that ESFPs get a bit of a bad rap. I think it's really easy to dismiss this type. And one of the reasons why we wanted to start with people of this personality type is not only do we have people in our lives that are near and dear to our hearts, but also to disabuse a bit of a notion about maybe the two-dimensional quality of an ESFP or the flighty nature. I think that there's some pretty strong depth there that we can talk about and do a deep dive into maybe some ways that an ESF, the people who are ESFPs and who are tired of some of these stereotypes, maybe ways that they can present that depth to the world and maybe get taken a little bit more seriously. So what we're going to do is we're going to first look at the wiring of the type. We're going to launch into what we call the car model for the personality type. And then we're going to do a little bit of a riff after that on components of how they show up, ways that they can show up better, maybe some leverage points for growth, and um, and just recap the, the, the ESFP type. Yeah, and if you're following along and you've heard some of the other podcasts around the deep dives into the types, you know that the four-letter code ESFP is basically just the first start starting point for understanding your personality and mostly how your mind is wired, how you're learning information, how you're making decisions. And what ESFP gives us is it gives us the learning and decision-making style that you're using as an ESFP. We use something called the CAR model. If you're not familiar with this yet, if this is a if you're a new listener to the Personality Hacker podcast, we recommend before we get started, going over to personalityhacker.com and just getting a visual look at the car model. By searching car model in the search bar, it'll pull up a blog and some information around the car model. And you can see how this looks visually as we talk about what are technically called cognitive functions. This is the wiring of your mind are going to fit in this car model. And you're going to see visually how we're how they're interplaying with each other as we unpack some of this. So we'll be talking about what you just mentioned, Joel, which is technically called the cognitive function stack for people of this personality type. We'll be looking at it through the lens of this metaphor of the car model. And so in the car model, you have a driver process that is your go-to tool in your toolbox. It is the strongest component of how your mind is wired. And it's supplemented by a co-pilot, which is a part of you that balances you out and gives you access to components of your personality that are vital but wouldn't be represented in the driver if the driver was the only part of who you are. So the co-pilot, we call it a co-pilot because it rounds you out and helps you navigate through life. Then behind the co-pilot sits a 10-year-old. This is a less sophisticated part of who you are, but it's got enough maturity to be able to influence your decisions. And then behind the driver sits a three-year-old. And the three-year-old is the least sophisticated part of your personality. However, it's a very important part of who you are. And we'll we'll be covering how it's important and how it shows up for you. So the driver process is what we've nicknamed sensation. And the technical name for sensation is extroverted sensing. This is a perceiving or learning process, and this is how you take in information. It's where your attention goes. It's how you understand the world around you. And we just did a podcast on sensing personality types where we talked a little bit about what the sensation process looks like. I recommend listening to that podcast if you want to get more of a deep dive into what sensation looks like and how it operates. But more on a uh, sort of on a uh, less of a deep dive level, what sensation basically does is it's a real time interactive experience with the world around you using your sense your senses. And we have more than five senses. We know the five primary senses, but we also have like a sense of 
temperature and sense of balance and sense of time. And we have all these re- sense receptors out trying to pick up as much information around us as possible and all of us have this capacity obviously otherwise if we didn't we'd walk into doors so obviously we all have our senses at a level where we can engage with the environment but if you can imagine it being your driver process like the primary way that you engage with the world it means that this is supercharged all your senses are heightened you're paying attention to all these real-time details. And the one thing that I've noticed about ESFPs in particular is that they don't miss a thing. In the moment, they miss nothing. And I've noticed that this this ability to be crazy observant, they don't always let you know that they've caught things. I mean, and when I say that, I mean, like, if you're trying to surreptitiously, I don't know, scratch your nuts, an ESFP is going to notice. They might not say anything, but they're going to know what you're doing. (laughs) You can't get anything by them. And it's almost a little disconcerting, (laughs) at least for me, knowing that they have the superpower of being able to pick up all the stuff that's being thrown at them in the moment. But it also means that that is their that's their sandbox. That's the world that they love to play in. So anything that gets them present, anything that gets them in the moment and in their body and in these in these senses, that's what juices them. That's what makes them feel alive. That's what, you know, regenerates their batteries. And that's why they have a tendency to be so sensual. They're sensual in either athletic ways or they're sensual in indulgent ways. They love adrenaline, they love excitement, they they want to be entertained and they want to be entertaining. And you can see this show up for ESFPs all the time. In fact, this is one of the major complaints that we saw in the survey that we sent out, that they feel like people don't take them seriously because they show up in such a playful way. And because they're showing up as play and fun and adrenaline and excitement and, and entertaining and being entertained, that people feel that that's all there is to them. But that's not exactly accurate because they're supplementing that driver process with a co-pilot that we call authenticity but is technically called introverted feeling. Now, introverted feeling is anything but shallow. Introverted feeling is incredibly deep. This is the process that we talk about being highly introspective and being really in touch with your own emotional state and how you're feeling about things and what's impacting you, what's important, identity, conscience, conviction, these all live in that authenticity process. And the more an ESFP develops themselves and the more they go to that space and really understand who they are, what their identity is about, what their convictions are, the deeper they are as people. And that's why I think ESFPs indicate that they feel like People see them two-dimensionally because they show up as this fun, playful, entertaining, entertained component or person. And yet here is this depth to them. Here is this part of them that really wants to go inside and be introspective and ask themselves how they feel about things and form convictions and, and form that component that is quite deep. Yeah. And you have, you're marrying this sensation, you know, this ability to observe things in real time, be very present. And you're marrying that with that internal process, that authenticity process. And that co-pilot is how the ESFP makes decisions. So they're they're learning information by real-time observation in the world. Their, their senses are present and open and taking everything in. And then from their internal feeling process, that introverted feeling place, that authenticity place, they're making determination and judgment and decisions based on that, that sensation input. And what happens, I think for ESFPs in particular, is because how they make decisions is a feeling process. It's about what resonates on a deep level, what feels right. And and their senses are taking the information in. And you used the word sensual earlier, which I think is a really good word for an ESFP. I think ESFPs are very in touch with their bodies and using their bodies as an instrument to let them know whether something feels right and good or whether something feels wrong and bad. And I think that is something that ESFPs do very, very well. Probably, I don't know more than or more or better than other types, but this is definitely a superpower that ESFPs bring to the table. This ability to really feel something so strongly and sense it strongly. So like like the sensations that are coming at them feel so powerful and real in the moment. And you'll often see ESFPs attracted to things, you know, that are that are energetic, 
our fun loving, our sensual experiences, whether it's riding, you know, motocross and doing flips, backflips in like the X Games on ESPN, or whether it's dance or performance, or whether it's, you know, being a chef, being somebody that cooks or, or is really in touch with how food tastes, the nuance of food and their palate. There's this sensation and also tied to the body, the feeling in the body and how it makes them feel viscerally, a kinesthetic experience for everything that they go through in life. And so I think that ESFPs bring us a superpower of helping us get in touch with the, with those those experiences almost vicariously as we're watching them maybe perform in a concert or maybe watching them perform a sport, a sport of some sort, like an extreme sport, whether that's skiing or motocross or whatever, or it's cooking, giving us an experience of this amazing food that tastes very interesting. I think ESFPs do this very well. They bring us this experience we can all learn from because they're so in touch with how these things make them feel. They can help others feel these very kinesthetic and kinetic real-time experiences yeah and they do it fearlessly and, absolutely and unapologetically i don't know this to be true because i've never personally profiled him my suspicion is that justin timberlake is an esfp i don't know that to be true but the way that he physically moves and the way that he presents himself is so effortless that's what i always think of when i think of how esfps they they help us get in touch with a part of us that is so kinesthetically aware and it's beautiful. It's really beautiful to watch ESFPs in performance when they've mastered a craft. And and I think that we we actually get a lot of benefit from ESFPs. I can think of a ton of ESFPs that are comedians, that are performers, that are artists in specifically performance art, and athletes, etc. And and these are all stereotypes, right? They're gross over generalizations about about people who use the sensation process. And yet I think it I think that's part of what they bring to the social ecosystem is they they help us understand what's possible when it comes to physical pursuits. The other thing about the sensation process that ESFPs are using is it is about pure experiential sensation. There's not a lot of story attached to the information that an ESFP is going through the world and picking up. It's primarily about getting the input of that sensory experience first, and you can make a story later, but there's not there's not a story barrier. There's no narrative that's giving them a barrier for experiencing. So when you use the word fearless, you know, unapologetic, or I think you use it unapologetic, I think of fearless also. I think the reason why ESFPs show up so fearless and unapologetic is because they're not worried so much about how the story plays out for the thing they're embodying. They just want to experience that fully and present in the moment, that feel that kinesthetic body feeling of that sensation and that experience. It's very experiential. And then later, a story can come from that. A narrative can come from that. But initially, it's just about the experience itself. Yes, and I, I'm glad you mentioned that because I think what can happen is people can superimpose their stories onto why an ESFP is doing something. And that can be really hurtful to the ESFP. <laughs> like that's not at all what they intended. That wasn't at all the original reason why they did something or their original intent. And so I think that they can sometimes feel very judged by others. They can sometimes feel very hurt by other people's judgments. Because like you said, it was for them, it was just about the experience. It wasn't really about any specific story of like why they did what they did. Now, of course, that creates a blind spot. If you have no narrative or story when you when you do something, but everybody around you has narrative and story around why you did it, and then suddenly you're now caught up in a drama or embroiled in some sort of, you know, you did something that everybody else thinks is really terrible and you, you can't figure out why. I think that's why it's so important for ESFPs to really focus on developing that co-pilot process of authenticity. Because authenticity at its at its youngest forms, its least sophisticated forms, asks what feels right to me. Like what feels good to me? Like what what am I what is going to feel maybe kinesthetically good or what is going to feel good to me on, you know, on a personal level? How do I get my emotional needs met? And the more developed it gets, the more sophisticated it gets, then it starts to ask questions like, what feels right to me? What feels ethically right or morally right? And it takes an ESFP from a more uh, pleasure pursuit level and just getting that quick hit, that in the moment quick rush maybe of approval from other people or under, or knowing that they're being entertaining or maybe just 
feeling the senses that they want to be feeling in the moment it takes them from from that space to okay i can do this if i want to but does that resonate with who i am is this the kind of person i want to be do i want to show up as this kind of person and because they lead with sensation you know like i mentioned before they don't miss anything they don't miss any details and that includes the detail of how other people are perceiving them so there might be some resentment around how other people judge them or perceive them in a way that they didn't intend. But that's reality. That's just how reality works. Other people are going to be judging us and perceiving us in certain ways. So that identity piece that authenticity brings helps them ask themselves, is that how they want to be showing up? Is that how they? Is that the kind of impact they want to have? Is that the influence they want to have over other people? Or do they want to show up as more authentic, as a role model, as somebody who is reaching for a higher value that resonates with the ESFP themselves. And that's why that authenticity piece is so important. In the survey, we got a lot of responses about relationships. I think ESFPs had responded a lot as one of their challenges about the longevity and the deepness of relationship. There there was some frustration around this. And I think what you're talking about, growing this authenticity process, is where, where the key lies here for the ESFP. If you're listening and you're an ESFP, there's there's probably this experience where you you have you probably love the feeling of falling in love in the in the initial parts of a relationship. I'm just going to use relationship as an example of your authenticity here, and this can apply to other things as well. You probably love the feeling of falling in love. You love the visceral feeling, all the butterflies in your stomach, your heart pumping, the the maybe the sexual arousal you have from that relationship, that new relationship you're falling in love with, and everything feels fun. It's present. You're feeling new sensational experiences with this person, and you love to touch them or kiss them or hold them. And, and the, the whole falling in love experience is really pleasant and exciting. And then you maybe get into a relationship and some struggles happen. And again, if you're using your authenticity to say, what feels good to me? What feels good? It doesn't feel good when you're fighting with a lover or a spouse or somebody you're in a relationship with. It doesn't feel good when there's some tension or maybe there's some just, maybe there's not even tension, but there's a lull in the relationship. Maybe things aren't as fun. Maybe there's a new child on the scene and, you know, it's more day in and day day out grind of life. And you're not just enjoying that falling in love or that honeymoon, quote unquote, experience. Well, asking yourself what feels good, I think even one person even put this on the survey. They said, you know, after after a while, I start to get bored and I'm looking for that rush, that that feeling of falling in love again. And so I don't stay with relationships very long. Once it gets either boring or difficult, I tend to say, okay, what's the next new exciting thing to do? And I think that's an ESFP asking themselves what feels good to me right now or in a very short time frame. If you, sh- if you shift that authenticity question from what feels good to what feels right, and you can use that authenticity experience, that, that part of you that resonates deeply at the core level about your core values and what's authentic to you, that's going to extend your timeline to give you the ability to move past some of those boring or challenging times in relationship. Because now you're asking yourself, This might not feel good in the moment, but it does feel right that this person and I have built some experience together. We've built some love and affection together. And this is a lull, maybe a boring time or a difficult time. But I know it's right to stay with this person because we've built something together. And I know there are good times coming down the road because I can feel it. I feel this is right for me. And so shifting that gives you more of a timeline. And I think we also, other ESFPs that were saying, you know, I I have a hard time planning into the future. You know, more than three weeks for me, planning is very difficult and challenging because again, I I would say that this, this ESFP is asking themselves what feels good right now in the next two or three weeks. But if you start asking yourself what feels right to me over the long term, you're going to start opening yourself up to much longer timelines and seeing what resonates with you on a longer perspective, on a longer timeline. And I think that's going to give you much more of a rich, centered, grounded, authentic life that you actually want to create for yourself. And it won't allow your sensation process and that asking what feels good in the moment to hijack that experience for you. Yeah, it feels like there is a push-pull relationship between meeting other people's expectations and wanting to, you know, wanting approval. All of us want approval, but certain personality types, I think, are more sensitive than others. I think ESFPs can be quite sensitive to other people's approval. And at the same time, they have such an independent streak and they have such a 
a like a, a a pursuit of what is important or not important to them, but like what's on their mind, right? Like they're this is the thing I want to be doing, so I'm going to go do it, and I'm not going to bring any narrative or story. And then all of a sudden, now I'm getting disapproved of for the thing that I was like I was totally innocent. I just wanted to go do that. So there's this weird relationship I think that ESFPs have with approval, and one of the ways that they've maybe learned to strategize or game the system is by allowing other people to set the tone for their ethics and morals. If they can, I I think all of us have a tendency to do this to some extent, outsource our values to other people and, you know, allow other people to influence us into what's going to be important to us. But I think ESFPs, if they don't really take the time to, to ask themselves, what is authentic, like authentically important to them as an individual, if they've allowed maybe parents or paradigms to super influence them, I've noticed there's a sense of stuckness that they get. Like, like take, for example, an ESFP in a marriage that maybe is becoming mundane. Okay, so the marriage has lost, it's no longer in the honeymoon phase. Maybe you got a couple kids. Maybe you're going to work every day, you know, day in and day out grind. And you're, you have decided that one of your values is that you are not going to get divorced. Like you are never going to re- leave this relationship. But it's not yours. This is not your value. This is a value picked up someplace. You were raised with this idea that divorce is absolutely, completely not acceptable. However, a value of yours is not that infidelity is wrong, or maybe it is, but you're allowing yourself to ignore that. And now the idea of cheating on your spouse becomes a lot more, maybe not even attractive. It might feel like a survival strategy. It might feel like you have to be able to have that in order to survive this life that is otherwise unbearable to you. Now, how would you get yourself out of this pickle? (laughs) Well, the question isn't, you know, reevaluate, ask yourself if divorce is acceptable and stop cheating, right? It would be more like, what is it in your life that you are doing, living, embodying that is actually unacceptable to you? And does it have anything to do with maybe your relationship? Maybe it's something completely different. Maybe you're living holistically a life that is not authentic to you and you're just trying to survive it. So can you go in and ask yourself, what, what is actually my, what is the life I want to be living? What is real to me? How can I maybe re-examine my relationship with my spouse and go, how do we put the fire back into it? How do we make it so that it's, you know, the relationship that we've always wanted? And if that means, you know, re-evaluating previously held beliefs, maybe, maybe you want to do a polyamorous relationship. Maybe that's the thing that's authentic to you, but you don't think you have permission to it. Or maybe it has nothing to do with polyamory or cheating or whatever. Maybe it has to do with just living a more exciting life. Maybe it means traveling more. Maybe it means spicing up the bedroom more. Maybe it means like whips and chains or just, you know, uh, maybe lingerie every once in a while. Who knows? But what are you not giving yourself permission to do? that is having you ignore maybe other values that are much closer to who you are. And I'm actually using this as an example because I know of a situation of an ESFP who's right in the middle of this. And they have outsourced so many of their personal ideals to somebody else, to parents, to paradigms, etc., that they're actually offending their conscience in order to survive it meaning that they're they're taking actions that they would themselves say are wrong in order to survive a situation that has become unbearable to them so what i recommend as an esfp and that probably sounds very abstract but what i recommend is really make sure that all of your decisions in your life the job you're choosing, the paradigm that you're in, the people who have influenced what you think is right and wrong. Make sure that all of those are absolutely resonating with who you are to the core of your being. Because if even just one of those major nodes is off, then you're going to find yourself doing things that you are not proud of in order to survive it. And that's what we mean by really making sure that authenticity is 100% authentic. And that's how you don't lose that depth. That's how you make sure that you're not the flighty person who's just looking for one fun situation in order to survive your day of boredom. It makes sure that you are rested and grounded and rooted in the things that are important to you, the things that mean something to you, and that you craft a life where all that fun stuff can be a part of it without compromising your conscience. Now, you might be asking yourself, why are you guys harping on that authenticity process? I thought you just said that's my co-pilot. 
that's my natural way of making decisions. You just you said I learn information as an ESFP using sensation, and I make decisions using authenticity. So why do you keep encouraging me to do the thing that I'm already doing? Well, here's the challenge with that. Sitting in that car model we talked about, right behind that co-pilot of authenticity, is another mental process, technically called extroverted thinking. We've given a nickname of effectiveness, and it's got the development of about a 10-year-old child, in your personality, metaphorically speaking. And what effectiveness is all about, this is also a decision-making process. And what happens in our personality, for various reasons, is we end up skipping past our co-pilot often, and using our 10-year-old process to help us make our decisions. And as an ESFP, this can be very intoxicating because you're in the moment. You are out in the outer world getting lots of information, lots of sensational experiences. You're kinesthetic. You're in real time. And you want to make quick decisions based on all this information coming at you, based on all these experiences, based on all these senses that you're picking, all the sensation you're picking up. Authenticity is a slow process. It takes a while. It's introspective. It's an introverted process. You have to take time. You've got to really get in touch with how your heart feels about issues, how your core values are aligning, what what resonates with you on a deep fundamental level. That takes that takes meditative thought. That takes a lot of internal work and a lot of slowing everything down to be able to do that. As an ESFP, you're used to moving quickly in the world. Well, man, that effectiveness process, that 10-year-old sitting in your back seat right behind your co-pilot is intoxicating because it gives you the ability to make quick, rapid decisions on all this information coming at you. It gives you the ability to be decisive and quick and get things done and force things in the outer world to happen. And so what ends up happening for you as an ESFP is you skip past that authenticity often and you'll use that 10-year-old process to make a lot of your decisions. But remember, it's only got the development in your personality in your mind of about a 10-year-old. So these, these decisions are not going to be very sophisticated. You'll be able to do a lot of things with this process. But when it comes to really big decisions in your life, like, you know, what should I do for a career? Or how should I engage with my boss tomorrow when he asked me this thing or she asked me this thing? Some of these decisions may not be best served using that effectiveness process because you're going to default to templates, to scripts, to things that are already pre-done for you, to things that'll just get it done in the moment, maybe not quality, but just finish the task and execute more than than really getting in touch with resonates with you. So our encouragement, and the reason why we were harping on this, getting into your authenticity process, is because as an ESFP, you're gonna be tempted to skip past it and go to that 10-year-old. But we wanna encourage you, the true growth for you, the true power in really expressing your personality to its fullest is getting in touch with that authenticity process. That's gonna mean that you're gonna have to slow things down. You're gonna have to get more introverted. You know, turn off the video games, turn off the, the, the media, turn off the sensory experiences, and really get in touch with how you're resonating with things. And this is gonna take some time. And it's a challenge for ESFPs to do this. This can definitely be a challenge for you if you're used to the adrenaline rush and the movement and all of the sensory experiences you're used to. Yeah, though the effectiveness process can show up in some really positive ways, and I want to talk about that in a moment. I would say that the world has a tendency to reward this process. Its its technical name is extroverted thinking, and it's about setting up systems and getting things done and marking things off of to-do lists. It's very much organized um, by getting projects handled, and the world loves that, right? especially the business world. So there's a lot of encouragement for anybody who's dealing with this particular construction of their personality type. And the, the other type that deals with this is ENFPs. So we talked a little bit about this in the ENFP podcast. But the world really likes effectiveness. And so you get a lot of approval and positive affirmation for going to this process because it makes you look busy and it makes you look industrious, right? Like you're getting things done. You have to fight that. You have to fight all the positive you know, affirmation you get for being in the effectiveness process if you are neglecting authenticity in, in, in behalf of it. Now, if you're not neglecting authenticity, if you have spent time in really understanding what's meaningful to you, who you are, what you want to bring to the world, what is ethically right, then effectiveness is a very, very important helper. It's almost like that 10-year-old minion that you have helping you clean the house. Like, go do that, go do that, go do that, and effectiveness will show up for you. 
I've noticed that one of the stereotypes around ESFPs is that they're not, um, that they can, they can be a bit uh, more playful oriented than serious and businesslike. And yet ESFPs might be some of the hardest workers that I can think of. When they combine that sensation process, which is being in their bodies and being in action with effectiveness, which is getting things done, as long as they are on the right trail, and the right trail is what authenticity gives you. Authenticity tells you which direction to go, okay? It helps you know which direction to go. And once you know for sure which direction to go, and you marry that sensation and effectiveness, there is nothing that can get in your way. You will just work and work and work and work and work until you collapse. But I have noticed that because of the configuration of the of these functions, these mental processes, generally ESFPs are the hardest workers when it comes to physical work. And it doesn't necessarily have to mean manual labor, but it means that they have to be able to get up and down a lot. That could be sales. Uh, that could be performance. That could be anything that doesn't have them chained behind a desk. If you're an ESFP and you're sitting behind a desk, you're a desk jockey, your life is probably pretty miserable right now. And I highly recommend looking for something else, <laughs> something that won't make you so miserable. But for people who are of this type, when it comes to you, to careers and jobs and anything that puts them in their body they can they can just go endlessly I've never seen anybody be able to go as long and as hard as an ESFP when they are doing a job and they'll just keep going until they collapse and and they'll have more stamina than most people so any stereotypes around ESFPs being lazy or being more playful oriented as opposed to hard workers are kind of baffling to me now obviously anybody of any type can be lazy and anybody of any type can be a hard worker my observation has been that the trend for ESFPs is that they actually are very hard workers. Now, one thing they do have a challenge with is not necessarily in the hardworking component. It's in saving and planning for the future. And now the reason why this is a challenge for ESFPs is the three-year-old process that sits behind the driver is what is technically called their inferior or your inferior cognitive function. And we like to call it a three-year-old because that helps illustrate just what level of development this this process is at. And the three-year-old process for an ESFP is what we call perspectives, or what is technically called introverted intuition. Now, introverted intuition or perspectives, if you listen to our podcast about the INJ types, you'll know that this is all about future pacing. It's about perspective shifting. It's about being inside your mind and watching your own mind form patterns and seeing way into the future and seeing trends. And this is a three-year-old process for ESFPs. So that future pacing part, that part of them that like sees way down into the future and plans for the future, this is not their area of expertise. In fact, it's the opposite of their area of expertise, which is being present and in the moment and catching all of these details around them in real time. So there's been a there was a lot of comments on the survey that we got back that said that this is this is a problem for them, that this is something they really like they acknowledge is a struggle, which is thinking about the future. You know, you mentioned that person who said that anything more than three weeks is almost like they can't even see it, right? They can only really think in three-week chunks. And another person said saving money and make, making and saving money. ESFPs may or may not have trouble making money, but they do have a tendency to, whatever is in their hand, they have a tendency to spend, right? Because that's fun in the moment. That is enjoyable. That is that is rewarding to all of their senses is to purchase something new. And so being able to save money is almost always a struggle for ESFPs. One thing that an ESFP can do in order to make up for this is do what all of us have to do, which is when we're talking about areas that are a blind spot, this is an area where we probably need to outsource that. We probably need to hire somebody or get somebody else to set something up for us. Like I'm, I'm an ENCP. I will never do my taxes ever again. <laughs> like ever, ever, ever. That's like an ongoing theme in the podcast where I talk about my total complete loathing of taxes and I will never do taxes ever again. I will always hire that out. And that's just because I understand that that's my blind spot. So for an ESFP, there are strategies you can utilize to call in other people to help you save Save money because this is probably not something that you're ever going to personally, quote unquote, get a handle on. Yeah, I know an ESFP, he and his wife were, you know, they would see money in their bank account from the paycheck and they would end up spending more than they wanted to every month. And they actually consulted with a financial advisor who set them up with a system that when they had a direct deposit of their paycheck, a portion of that immediately off the top would go toward an account, a bank account 
that had automatic draws to pay all their bills, and then another bank account that put forced savings for them. So by the time that the remnant of that paycheck got into their spendable bank account for spending money, they knew that all the other stuff had been taken care of beforehand, and they could spend that money whatever way they wanted to. They could see it in their bank account, they could spend it, and it's working really great for he and his wife because all their bills are taken care of automatically, there's a system set up, and all of their saving is forced, so they don't have to think about it. It's almost like a tax. It's like when your your W-2 or your taxes get taken out of your paycheck immediately. By the time you get your paycheck, you, you don't even see those taxes that were taken out. They're just off the top. And that's how the system they set up for themselves was. So they used a, a financial consultant to help them future pace and set up a system to accommodate for that real time, you know, having the money in the bank and wanting to spend it. And I thought that was a brilliant way that they have solved the problem around uh, not overspending or not being able to future pace or save for the next month when maybe times get tough or something of this nature. I think that's a great example of how you as an ESFP might think about setting up conditions for you that allow you to still stay present and flexible and free and present in the moment and yet still take care of the things that need to be taken care of for the long term. Yeah. One thing that happens for processes that live in our three-year-old position or our inferior is that we, we are influenced by these processes. We are influenced by, by them in ways that we might not be able to see. And for the perspectives process, because it is about seeing all sorts of different, you know, running different simulations and seeing so many different possibilities and future pacing and seeing what can't be seen, Because it's a three-year-old process, this can be the source of some fear for ESFPs. If you are an ESFP and you've ever dealt with any sort of paranoia or any sort of fear of conspiracy, and when I say conspiracy, I I mean, I guess it could mean like big global or governmental conspiracy, or it can just mean like all of a sudden fearing that your mate is cheating on you and you have no idea why, or maybe some jealousy issues, or thinking a friend you know, they, they acted in a way that was bizarre to you and you, th- and you took it personally and you think that they're upset with you. Any sort of projection of, of something going wrong and you're not sure what the source is and then all of a sudden now you're feeling a little paranoid or fearful, that's just how that process can show up for you. And it doesn't necessarily mean that there's a lot of legitimacy there. You're much better when you get to, when you are actually directly experiencing something and verifying it for yourself firsthand. That's how sensation works. So if you find yourself feeling any sort of paranoia or any sort of, you know, tendency to think that people are out to get you in any sort of way or that the future is filled with scary things or like things like disaster is just about to, to happen because things are going too well. Make sure that you pull yourself out of that space and get into the sensation space to verify your fears. If if it's not actually something that's happening to you right now, or if you go talk to a friend and say, hey, what was going on over there? Like, you acted in this funny way. Was that about me? Or are we cool? And the person goes, oh, yeah, I just had like a bad day at work. Or no, it has nothing to do with you. Or yeah, actually, I'm kind of upset with you. Hammer it out. Like, take make sure that you are not just allowing these fears to live inside you, but you're actually going and verifying whether or not there's any legitimacy to them. And if there's no reason to feel a fear of what's coming down the pike, if there's no actual real reason that you can verify in the moment that there's something coming up for you, or maybe you consult with friends and go, am I missing something? Or is is something coming up for me that I'm not seeing? And everybody's like, no, you're cool. You're okay. You're probably going to be fine. But it does mean that that three-year-old process might need some attention. And that might be how it's showing up for you to get attention. Just like a three-year-old behind you in a car might kick your seat or scream or, you know, say your name over and over and over again to get some attention. And one way you can do that is through very simple meditative practices. Perspectives is about getting completely away from sensory experience. It's about being entirely inside your own mind. And really simple meditations can do that. Now, I know somebody who is an ESFP who is a bodybuilder. And when they work out, what they do is they take that time to be meditative. He mentioned, he calls it meditating on the muscle when he's working out. And working out might feel like a sensation thing, right? It might feel like getting in your body. But it's also a way to hypnotize sensation, like make sensation feel like it's doing something so it's not trying to take over. And then like maybe you could do this on a treadmill and then utilize this opportunity to have sensation be distracted by physically working out or being on a treadmill and then get inside your mind and just allow yourself to maybe meditate. Meditative music, you know, binaural beats or something to that effect might really help with this. And another thing you can do is just go ahead and allow yourself to enjoy a harmless intuitive pursuits. 
the not the ones that have you questioning the future, not the ones that have you maybe paranoid about the future, but ones that are maybe more, I don't know, like innocent pursuits. Um, I mean, I know that there are some people who believe like daily horoscopes or anything other than innocent. And yet I know a lot of ESFPs who are very curious about their daily horoscope or what their sign is. And these are... These are... It's playful almost. Yeah, like playful ways to get into that intuitive process. Uh, Crystal healing. I know an ESFP that wears magnets in order to increase blood flow. Like these are relatively harmless ways to play around with your intuitive process. And it allows you to enjoy that. Like you don't have to necessarily take it super seriously. This doesn't have to be something that you're like setting your clock to. It can just be like a fun way to navigate that space and enjoy something that isn't so verifiable, isn't something that you can like directly look at and experience. It allows you to get into in touch with something maybe a little transcendent or spiritual. Spiritual pursuits are also something that could live in that perspectives pro- process. So, you know, something that really allows you to play there, but isn't necessarily going to, you know, push you into thinking that now you know what's coming up and you've got this massive predictive power and it's going to be bad, right? Like anytime you feel yourself feeling icky around it, maybe you let off the pedal a little bit, but allows yourself to go towards m- more benign intuitive pursuits because that's a piece of who you are. That intuitive part is part of who you are. And one way that I've, I mean, I know that I'm, I know that I've already taken a lot of time talking about this, but I just dawned on me. One way that I've really seen this intuitive piece come up for ESFPs is in interpreting people's body language. I've noticed that actually ESFPs are some of the best at interpreting body language. And that's a combination of that sensation process, right? Picking up all the little nuances of what people are doing and then combining it with patterns of what that can mean for the person. Reading body language is a really great way for an ESFP to play around with that intuitive perspectives process and at the same time really incorporating their strength of sensation. So find ways to play around in that space, especially if you find yourself getting more and more paranoid. It means that 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 needs a little more attention and you need to pursue it in a more benign and benevolent way. If you're an ESFP listening or you have an ESFP in your life, the message I hear from ESFPs and people that interact with ESFPs is that they're shallow. And I think this idea of an ESFP being shallow and being dismissed by people is not right because... I believe there's a lot more depth to you as an ESFP. And I believe that the way the world sees that depth is, again, we're going to keep harping on this, is by getting into that authenticity process, slowing down and asking yourself, what feels right to me? What is authentic? What resonates? What is at the core of my being and my heart? What do I feel is the right thing in the situation? And if you ask yourself that question and you get in touch with that authentic experience for yourself... I believe people will see the true depth you have there. I believe that you as an ESFP have a lot more depth than the world gives you credit for. And you know this about yourself. You know you have a lot of depth and a lot of insight and a lot of resonance with how the world works and how the right thing to do in certain situations. And often people just don't see it. You're moving so quick and maybe you're in that 10-year-old process of effectiveness. But getting in that authenticity, people are going to start to realize just how deep you are and just how much you bring to the table for the world. Yeah, it's it really is a leverage point for being taken seriously. I think the other thing is too, and this is for anybody who's listening that might not be of this type, all of us have a vetting process that we go through to determine whether or not we want to be intimate with somebody. And for an ESFP, this is this is that fun that people see of them. They're looking for playmates. Now, I have a vetting process, too. I think everybody has a vetting process, like a first point of entry. For me, it's absurdist humor. I know if I can connect with somebody, finding the absurd hilarious, I know that we can get through anything. Like, hard times, fights, things that are going wrong. I'm not sure if I ever want to talk to this person again. And then all of a sudden, we have this like moment where we share a reference to a Monty Python skit and we're laughing our butts off and like, I know it's going to be okay, right? Like, like I know that I can get through anything if that person shares absurdist humor with me. So that becomes a first point of entry for me in vetting intimate relationships. For an ESFP, they're looking for playmates. That's a first point of entry for them to have fun and to be able to just let loose and have fun and not take everything so seriously. And after you go through that first point of entry, 
then you can get to the depth. That's when they show you depth is after you get through that gatekeeper. Yeah. And all of us have one of those. I would hate it if people only saw me two-dimensionally based on absurdist humor. If the the whole or the entirety of my personality or character was being judged based on that that first point of entry, that would drive me crazy because I'm way more than that. For ESFPs, it's similar. That is a first point of entry. That is a vetting process to make sure that, that they want to be more intimate with you. And unfortunately, because that's a first point of entry, people see their entire personality as being wrapped up in that that gatekeeper. And that's got to be maddening. So just keep that in mind. And if you are of this type and you find yourself not being taken seriously by other people and they just see you as always one to have fun, please feel free to communicate that directly. Go, hey, I just... I like to know that people can have fun with me. And then once I vet that, once I know that they're in a position to be able to just let loose and have fun and be a playmate, that's when I show them my deeper self. So it's important to remember that all of us have one of these. All of us have something that we know if we can just connect on this one particular level, then we're going to be able to get through anything in a relationship. If you can sympathize with that and identify what it is for you and then realize for an ESFP that just happens to be fun and the playmate component, then you can understand that there's a lot more depth behind that and to not marginalize or you know, oversimplify the whole person based on that initial point of entry. The whole reason we talk about personality types here, personality hacker, and focus on this for you as the ESFP is because once you understand your personality on a fundamental level, now you can custom tailor a personal growth journey for yourself that's just tailored for you. And that's really what we get excited about. That's the heart and soul of why we do what we do is for personal growth and personal development. You can come over and express your opinions, your thoughts about this podcast, what you're thinking, what's resonating with you, what questions you have, and what your experience has been over on the personalityhacker.com website. There's a place just below this podcast to leave some feedback and questions in the comment section. We'd love to hear from you there. You can also join us at facebook.com forward slash personalityhacker or twitter.com forward slash personalityhack. You can also subscribe to us on iTunes and various Android platforms. And if you're in a giving mood, you can leave a rating and review on iTunes. Each rating and review helps us out in their iTunes algorithm for recommending us under other podcasts. So if you're in a giving mood, please feel free to leave a rating and review. Thanks for being a part of the podcast this week. My name is Joel Mark Witt. And I'm Antonia Dodge. And we'll talk with you again on the next Personality Hacker podcast.